Hey everyone, welcome back. Ready to dive into another hot topic. Always up for a deep dive. What are we tackling today? Today, it's all about income inequality, right here in America. <laughs> we actually have two sources this time around. Oh, interesting. Two perspectives. Which are they? So we got some excerpts from Cold War 2.0, Dawn of the Asian Millennium by Andranik Agazarian. I've heard of that one. And we're also going to be looking at this article called Nine Charts About Wealth Inequality in America. Okay, so those titles sound a little, maybe a little textbooky. Maybe, a little bit. But I'm sure they're packed with some eye-opening stuff. Oh, absolutely. Like, get this. A Gazarian cites a survey from 2019 that found almost 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. Wow, that's, that's a huge chunk of people. It's a massive number. Like, imagine almost 7 out of 10 people you know wouldn't be able to handle, say, a sudden medical bill or a car repair without going into debt. That's a really unsettling thought. Have you have you noticed that friend yourself? I mean, just in your own life with, with people you know? I mean, it's definitely something you hear about more and more these days. Yeah, and it gets even, even more jarring when you think about the book, you know, $2 a day, living on almost nothing in America. Right, right. The researchers there, they found this this really disturbing increase in what they call the ultra core. So we're talking about households surviving on less than $2 per person per day. And those numbers, they've actually doubled since 1996. Doubled? Since 96? Yeah. That's that's pretty shocking. Yeah, it really is. And what makes it even more, I don't know, thought-provoking is that we always hear about economic growth, right? Yeah. So, so why are so many people being left behind in that growth? That's a really good question. Cold War 2.0. It actually touches on this too, you know, like it highlights the fact that more than half, more than half of all the kids in public schools today qualify for free or reduced price lunches. Because of their family's income. Exactly. It's like a, it's a direct link to how these economic trends, they're not just numbers on a page. They have a very real impact on people's lives. For sure. And Agazarian, he goes on to paint this picture of like a whole generation that's just struggling to get a foothold. You know, he says almost half, like almost half of 25 year olds are still living at home. With their parents. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you have to wonder what economic recovery really means if so many people are still struggling to even move out and get started on their own. It really makes you question that whole narrative, doesn't it? Absolutely. Like, what does success even look like? Because clearly it's not reaching everyone. And Agazarian really emphasizes this isn't just a U.S. problem, this wealth gap. It's, it's getting bigger all over the developed world. Right. But I think what makes it stand out more here is that we have this this whole ideal of America being the land of opportunity, right? The American dream and all that. Exactly. And then you see these figures and, and it makes you wonder, you know, is it really is it really true for everyone? It makes you question the whole premise. Igazarian even quotes someone named Michael Snyder, who says, and this is a direct quote, if we truly are the greatest nation on the planet, then why can't we even take care of our own people? It's a powerful statement. Yeah. And a valid question. What are we doing? Where is that disconnect happening? And that's what's so important about these nine charts in the article we mentioned. They actually start to break down the different factors that are contributing to this divide. So we're diving into these nine charts from this article. Nine charts about wealth inequality in America. And I got to say, that first chart, it really kind of hits you in the face. It's pretty stark. It is. It shows how much wealth has shifted from the middle class to the absolute wealthiest families. And it's it's over the last 60 years, so it's not like a, a recent thing. Yeah, you can really see how that gap is just blown wide open over time. All right, in 1963, the wealthiest families, they had 36 times the wealth of middle-class families. Which is already a pretty big difference. Oh yeah, but by 2022, yeah, that ratio was 71 times. It's more than double. It's like this massive wealth transfer that most people didn't even see happening. It's crazy, and then you get to chart two. And it brings up another really important piece of this, the racial wealth gap. Right, because it's not just about income, it's about overall wealth. Exactly. And in 2022, the average white family, they had six times the wealth of the average black or Hispanic family. Six times. It's it's unbelievable. This huge disparity. It is. And what's even worse is that this gap, it doesn't stay the same. It actually gets bigger as people get older, which chart three shows that pretty clearly. And that's where this whole idea of structural racism comes in. You know, it's not just about like individual prejudices. It's about these systems and policies that have made it so much harder for people of color to build wealth over generations. 
Could you could you maybe give an example of one of those policies? Sure. Think about housing, for example. There are these policies like redlining that straight up prevented black families from buying homes in certain neighborhoods. So they couldn't even get into those neighborhoods, let alone build wealth through homeownership. Exactly. And that's just one example. But the effects of that kind of discrimination, they last for generations. So even if things are different now, the playing field isn't level because of that history. It's like... They're already starting the race so far behind. And these charts, they really emphasize how interconnected all of these different factors are. Charts four through eight, they look at things like earnings gaps, homeownership, retirement savings, emergency funds. And, and it's clear that black and Hispanic families are just consistently at a disadvantage. And it's not because they're not working hard or not trying to save. It's because the system makes it so much harder for them to get ahead. It's like this vicious cycle. It is. And then there's inheritance. Oh, yeah. Chart nine. That's a big one. It's crazy how much more likely white families are to receive an inheritance, which, again, just keeps that cycle going. It makes a huge difference in terms of intergenerational wealth. It does. It's like, you know, you hear about the American dream and working hard to build a better life for your kids. But if the system is set up in a way that makes it nearly impossible for certain groups to actually get ahead, then what does that even mean? It raises some really important questions about fairness and opportunity, for sure. It does. And I think it's great that this article doesn't just leave us with the problems. It actually offers some solutions, too. It's like we hear about these big issues all the time, but then it's like, OK, what do we do about it? And I feel like this article actually does a good job of of suggesting some concrete steps. Yeah. And what I like about it is that it doesn't just put the responsibility on individuals. You know, it's not just about telling people to work harder or save more. It's about recognizing that we need to fix the system itself. Because you're right. It's it's not a level playing field out there. Exactly. And that's where policy comes in. Right. The article really emphasizes that. Like one thing it talks about is making federal tax policies work better for, you know, low and middle income families. Okay, so like changing how some of those tax benefits work. Because right now, it seems like a lot of them benefit the wealthy more than anyone else. Right. Exactly. Like, those deductions for things like housing and retirement savings, they often end up helping those who already have a lot. So it's about making those policies fair so they actually help close the gap instead of widening it. So making them more progressive, where higher earners benefit less and those resources can be used to help lift up lower income folks. Yeah. Or even just looking at how those resources are allocated, you know. Could they be used more effectively to support those who need it most? Like one idea the article mentions is a savers match. Have you heard of that? Yeah, it's like a 401k match, but it's specifically designed to help lower income workers save for retirement. Exactly. Which is huge because so many people struggle to save, not because they don't want to, but because they just don't have the margin, you know? Yeah, it's it's hard to prioritize saving when you're just trying to make ends meet. Exactly. And the savers match idea, it's like it helps level the playing field a bit, gives yeah. everyone a chance to build some financial security. It's a cool idea. But be honest, how likely is it that we'll actually see some of these solutions put into practice? Like, it feels like there's always pushback when it comes to making big changes. Oh, for sure. There are always challenges. But I don't think it's impossible. I mean, we're already seeing some progress. Like, did you know that Oregon has implemented automatic enrollment in retirement savings plans? Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. And there's growing support for things like baby bonds, where every child would get a little nest egg at birth. Oh, wow. I like that idea. Give everyone a little bit of a head start. Right. It's about changing the way we think about these things, being proactive instead of reactive. Shifting from just trying to fix problems after they arise to actually building a system that's more equitable from the ground up. Exactly. And that's what gives me hope. Because it's not about handouts. It's about opportunity. It's about making sure everyone has a fair shot. I love that. It feels like we've covered so much ground in this deep dive. We've talked about the problem, dug into some of the root causes, and even explored some potential solutions. It's been a really great conversation. It has. But if our listeners could only take away one thing from all of this, what would you want it to be? I think the most important takeaway is that income inequality, it's not just an economic issue. It's a societal issue. It's about fairness. It's about opportunity. It's about justice. And it's up to all of us to create a world where everyone has a chance to thrive. Perfectly said. And on that note, we'll leave you with this. The next time you hear a statistic about income inequality, don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Think about the real people those numbers represent. 
Think about what kind of world we're creating and ask yourself, what can I do to be a part of the solution? Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll catch you on the next deep dive.